Uh, so happy new year to everyone and we'll uh, get going today. We are very uh, happy today to have Dr. Will Harrington from Oxford join us to uh, present uh, the data on MPA kidney as well as the flows and meta-analysis that was uh, subsequently published. Uh, Dr. Harrington is uh, a consultant nephrologist uh, in London and uh, part of the Oxford Clinical Trials uh, Unit. Uh, he, he's worked on many uh, notable trials in the past uh, shark being one of them uh, that we all know about, uh, but MPA kidney, of course, is the blockbuster that uh, we all want to know much more about. I won't belabor too much on the introduction. I will just let him uh, go ahead. Thanks again for joining us today, Will. Yes, thanks very much. Um, if you can't hear me, just stop me and carry on. Um, uh, I know it's your morning. I'm actually on Canada time as well because I was in Vancouver on the weekend and I, my body doesn't know if it's the afternoon or, or not but um, I hope that um, uh, this data which keeps um, exciting me is uh, enough to brighten your morning. So I'm a nephrologist but I've spent nearly all of my time um, designing and, and actually conducting trials a uh, part of the MRC population health research unit at the University of Oxford um, and so I, I think like a trialist sometimes you might mistake me as not being a nephrologist but I am actually a practicing nephrologist as well. But I'm presenting really on behalf of our the collaborative group, which has um, coordinated over eight countries, 241 sites, the MPA kidney trial. And uh, it's just a pleasure to bring you these data. Um, it was initiated by ourselves at the University of Oxford, um, and, but it was funded by Beringer. So I want to disclose that. Um, but it also had support from the Medical Research Council. And I get personal support from the government and also charity. Um, but we decline uh, departmental. The department has a policy for us to decline on our area, um, and I'm not funded by industry. So these are my own opinions and the interpretation of the collaborative groups uh, on the data that was published actually um, in the New England Journal. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, there was details of uh, it in full press. So. A presentation in two parts, one the MP kidney results, and I'll explain to you why there's a second part, which was uh, a meta-analysis uh, later on in the talk. But if uh, you, you want to break at the middle and ask questions particularly about MP kidney, then we can, um, and Swampner will um, uh, uh, chair at that point. I just wanted to start off though with telling you about the origins of MP kidney in terms of the idea. I mean, the idea stemmed directly from that MPREG outcome data in 2016 when the renal results were first announced. Um, and straight away, we saw the potential for this uh, agent to treat a much wider range of people with kidney disease. And we thought that even if it was half as good as the data in MPREG outcome, um, it would still be an important treatment. We never dreamed we'd see the results we see today. Um, and you'll see that we, we set up the the trial of the population approach because we're population scientists we're not precision medics and we did it actually in the absence of any knowledge of DAPA CKD um, the, the proposal the design um, was set up really by Oxford clinicians thinking about what we wanted to test as nephrologists what would be the questions we wanted to answer but of course there's been an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, trial results since um, um, uh, uh, 2016 there's been a series of type 2 diabetes high risk trials. There's been a series of amazing cardiovascular trials, both in people with and without diabetes. And of course, there's DAPA CKD, tremendous results to follow the credence results um, and then MPA kidney. So um, we'll try and put all of the results in that context. But the birth of MPA kidney was actually before we knew all of these other data. And we simply wanted to assess in a definitive way in a, in a double blind placebo controlled trial the effects of an SGLT2 inhibitor in a broad range of patients um, with CKD. Um, and we wanted to define them as um, a, a patient group at risk of progression, irrespective of whether or not they had diabetes or not, or whether or not they had a low level of albuminuria. So that's what we sent out to do. We sent actually proposals to three different companies, and we were really pleased that Beringer uh, uh, was uh, pleased, was, was happy to fund the trial, um, and we developed the protocol with them. But these were the uh, original inclusion criteria, which are really Oxford inclusion criteria from what was stemmed what's called the UK HARP3 trial, a trial we did in phase two with Sucupitrol Valsartan. And this is our simple way of identifying people at risk. Those have already progressed. That's a CKD EPI EGFR before screening and at screening of between 20 and 45. Or 
between 45 and 90 with some evidence of albinuria, which should predict them uh, uh, as being at risk of uh, a decline in kidney function over a period of years. We did exclude some participants uh, uh, from the trial. Um, those with polycystic kidney disease were ineligible because we thought uh, that there was differences in the mechanism. We thought that there was potential for cyst growth and there was also some uncertainty about urinary tract infections. Um, and that was a similar reason for excluding people with transplants is we didn't have the data of safety in urinary tract infections. But as you know, um, all of that has really disappeared as a concern and it's obviously a regret that we excluded anyone from the trial um, in retrospect. So um, the design was simple. Participants were required to be on an appropriate dose of a renin angiotensin inhibitor, but it could be included if it was not indicated or not tolerated. And then after a run-in, they are randomised one-to-one to, one to impact the flows in 10 milligrams versus a matching placebo. And it was event-driven, so we were uh, aiming to accrue at least 1,070 primary outcomes, which would give us 90% power to detect an 18% relative risk reduction. So you can see we were looking for rather modest effects because we, we, we didn't predict that the effects would be uh, uh, as large in people with lower levels of glycosuria induced by empagliflozin, such as those without diabetes. And this was the primary composite outcome. It was a composite of cardiovascular death or kidney disease progression, with kidney disease progression defined as a combination of clinical outcomes, hard clinical outcomes, what we called end-stage kidney disease when we were writing the protocol. So that's dialysis or transplantation or death from untreated kidney failure, uh, which is what we call a renal death, or an important sustained change in estimated GFR, so a surrogate of progression to kidney failure. And we used the greater than 40% sustained decline in EGFR because we knew this was a population which would have people at lower risk. We wanted to capture um, all those that were progressing, not just those that were progressing fast. Or they had to have a sustained EGFR less than 10, which for me is a better definition of kidney failure. That's when I start to really think about dialysis. I don't think of it around 15. Um, so uh, we used that and also enabled us to recruit a lower level of inclusion criteria of 20 because they still had some time to progress to 10 if we had used 15. In actual fact, some of the patients would have already been eligible, would have had a primary outcome at the time they were uh, randomised after the run-in periods. So that's the rationale. And then over the COVID pandemic, we still managed to recruit 6,600 people. These are their baseline characteristics. Um, on average, mean age 64, a third reported female sex, just over a half um, uh, uh, um, without diabetes. We importantly pushed the recruitment of people without diabetes, particularly after the DAPA CKD result um, uh, 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 and the credence result, which appeared earlier than we were expecting. Um, we have the lowest level of EGFR of all of the CKD trials uh, at 37, with more than a third with an EGFR less than 30. And that's because we recruited from nephrology centres in large part. And so really, we wanted to represent the types of patients that we were seeing in our nephrology clinics. When is it too late to start? Agliflozin was one of the questions we wanted to answer. And we also pushed the sites to recruit people with low levels of albinuria. And actually, those with A1 and A2 levels represented nearly half of the trial cohort. And we had the lowest level of median urinary ACR of the three kidney disease progression trials. Um, consequently, we had a large proportion of people without diabetic kidney disease and about a quarter had glomerular disease. Just over 20 percent had what we would have presumed to have been ischemic or renovascular disease. There was about 12 percent with a collection of other specified causes and 10 percent unknown. Then uh, we specified in the protocol a single formal interim analysis. Um, that's because in, in Oxford we always want to do a trial that's particularly long. Um, but um, uh, if uh, the results of the trial are overwhelming at a, a, an advanced stage within follow up, um, we agreed with the funder that we would have a look at about 60 percent of the events. And on the 7th of March, uh, the, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee reviewed that formal interim analysis and reported that the trial had met the pre-specified uh, criteria for stopping early. And so we started final follow ups and by the 5th of July, we had completed follow-up in all participants. Um, we had a median follow-up of two years at that point, uh, really very little withdrawal of consent and loss to follow-up. 
and rather reassuringly, despite the COVID pandemic, we'd managed to keep over 90% of participants taking most of their study treatment at the study midpoint. And actually we had very little, less than 1% drop into open label SGLT2 inhibitor use, which means the hazard ratios for the treatment effect you'll see are actually quite good estimates of the effect of an SGLT2 inhibitor. You don't have to factor them up substantially because you've got very little um, drop in and pretty decent adherence for a CKD trial. And then this was the result which uh, uh, what still stirs the emotions. This is the primary analysis uh, of the trial, that primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or kidney disease progression, 558 first events in those allocated placebo, 432 in those allocated to impagliflozin, which equates to a 28% relative risk reduction, a 95% confidence interval, 18% to 36%, a p-value, with several zeros, in fact, more zeros than you can see, um, uh, and a really rather um, uh, 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 um, convincing result that this intervention works. And the reason I am particularly pleased the trial um, showed a convincing result is because it showed a convincing result for what I was really interested in when we designed the trial, which was kidney disease progression. The vast majority of the 990 First primary outcomes were kidney disease progression, 888 of them were, and you can see that there was a clear reduction in risk. And the humps you see in those capillary my curves is because we tried to make this trial simple for people to do. So we only saw patients every six months, uh, unlike DAPA CKD, which saw them every four months. And we didn't do a recheck of their creatinine until six months later. So to find sustained required a check six months later. So our humps are relatively infrequent. They're every six months, and you can see the vast majority of the kidney disease progression data is based on the creatinines when we when we collected them. So we have the the uh, almost the amusement park um, slide type appearance to our Kaplan Meyer plot. But I want to just draw your attention to the fact that kidney disease progression and the effects were consistent across all of the different components of kidney disease progression. Um, uh, and what's really nice to see is that we definitively showed a reduction in the risk of end stage kidney disease. So that hard clinical outcome of needing to start dialysis or a CV kidney transplant, a, a third reduction. So consistent with the overall result. But the corollary of this trial being a mainly kidney disease progression trial is that that component of the primary outcome that was cardiovascular death represents a much smaller part of the data. It was a much lower cardiovascular event rate than we predicted perhaps because of recruitment in low risk populations like Japan, perhaps because of the secular trends. We modeled the trials data on SHARP, which did recruit back in 2003 and recruited from some middle as well as high income countries. And there may well have been um, strong change secular trends in reductions in cardiovascular mortality. And so we didn't see a clear result for cardiovascular mortality, but you'll see later this result is entirely consistent. This 16% non-significant reduction is completely consistent with the 16% relative risk reduction you see when all the trials are meta-analyzed together. So just not enough data in this population because there's low risk from cardiovascular disease. But if you combine that cardiovascular death with the hard clinical outcome of kidney failure, so starting dialysis or receipt of a kidney transplant, which was our uh, one of our secondary outcomes, then you can see that we reduced the two when they're combined um, by 27%, and that's clear a clear reduction. So um, our result is not only reducing progression based on a creatinine value, it's really reducing clinical risk. Um, and this is really important for health economics um, and for um, really um, uh, uh, those to accept the data. Um, yeah. So I guess we weren't surprised necessarily that, that that result was going to be seen given there was announcements that the trial stopped early but I think a lot of people were very interested in the subgroup analyses um, and so I'm going to show you the three subgroup analyses that we performed as the key subgroups. Um, I think there's a tendency for a lot of trials to run a series of subgroup analyses and then say the results look consistent but we really wanted to focus in as nephrologists on the key subgroups we thought that SGLT2 inhibitors might work differently in. Um, we know that when you have not got diabetes, that the levels of glycosuria that are induced by SGLT2 inhibitors are substantially reduced. And we really wanted to know whether or not this had an effect on the primary outcome. Um, and so this was the first of the key subgroups, and, and it's the diabetes subgroup. Um, in the diamond below is the overall result, that 28% relative reduction you saw earlier. 
And then what you see below in bold is the test for heterogeneity. So this is an interaction test or a test for effect modification. They're all the same, same meaning. And it, what it's doing is it's asking whether or not the effects in these two groups of patients differ um, significantly from each other. And this is a non-significant result. So for this um, relatively insensitive outcome, um, we find there's no difference between the two. So the best interpretation of the overall result of the trial is that it's a consistent result in people with and without diabetes. Um, I have to say we didn't pre-specify in the stopping rules um, that uh, the results in people with and without diabetes were part of the criteria, so it didn't have to be consistent effects. So it was very possible for there to be an enormous effect in those with diabetes and an adverse effect in people without diabetes. The trial could have still got stopped early. And that is the paranoia which drove me to um, collect the individual patient level data and do the smart C meta-analysis that you'll see later. Um, but um, this is really rather reassuring results for myself, because if you look at this, we've got 466 primary outcomes in people without diabetes. It really adds very substantially to the 128 that have been reported in DAPA CKD. It really confirms the hypothesis that uh, diabetic kidney disease and non-diabetic causes of kidney disease are importantly modified in terms of their risk of regression by SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, this was the second key subgroup. I really thought that we would start to see attenuation of the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors as you had lower levels of EGFR. But in this subgroup analysis, you can see that in actual fact, there's no evidence this, of this at all. 28% relative risk reduction and a trend test. So this is just a, a, a more powerful way of assessing for interaction and a trend test suggesting no evidence of uh, effect modification by level of EGFR and an enormous number of outcomes, um, over 560 uh, in the group with the lowest levels of EGFR that we see in our clinic. So really, the, it's, it's never too late to start an SGLT2 inhibitor. And this is a post hoc analysis um, because I mentioned to you earlier that we screened people and then we randomised them. There's a run in period. That run in period could be up to 15 weeks. So some of the participants who had an EGFR in their 20s at um, screening actually progressed over those periods to the point when they were randomized their EGFR was actually below 20. And we actually had about 250 of such people, 254 you can see here. And because these people already had the lowest levels of EGFR, they were actually at the highest risk of progressing um, to kidney failure. Um, and so we can do a postdoc analysis here where we pull out that subgroup of people with particularly low EGFR. And you can see uh, with just over 100 uh, events, that the actual fact the point estimates of effect is aligned overall again that doesn't affect the trend test and so we really aren't even beginning to see a threshold at all uh, at a level of EGFR where SGLT2 inhibitors stop being effective so uh, this has really um, uh, influenced my practice uh, uh, there's almost no one who is that um, pre-dialysis who I won't consider an SGLT2 inhibitor for um, uh, so uh, although this is not published, this is, a, I think, a really important analysis that I wish we'd thought of pre-specifying. And then this is the a point at which the data starts to run out and, and people have uh, paid particular attention to. This is the um, subgroup analysis by baseline level of albuminuria. So this is the last of the three key subgroups. Again, we felt that this was an important subgroup to assess because we felt that if intracomerular hypertension was the only mechanism by which these drugs were um, slowing kidney disease progression, in those with lower levels of albuminuria, we might find smaller effects. Um, and indeed, if you look at this trend test here, you can see that the test for effect modification is positive. So this is p values less than 0 0.05. So we have evidence for a difference of a size of a relative effect across the, the, the stages of uh, uh, CKD by albinuria. Um, and so depending if your glass is half full or half empty, you either say the results show that the effects are larger in people with, uh, with high levels of albinuria or they are attenuated in people with lower levels of albinuria. And of course, when I saw this result, first of all, um, my, my, my first question was, does this result here in people with normal albinuria which actually is only based on uh, 84 events with incredibly wide confidence interval, which of course includes the potential for it to be still a 28% relative risk reduction. Does this represent evidence of no effect or does it represent evidence of attenuated effect? 
Um, and so that was the real question that we wanted to explore before we published the data, um, because this is where the data ran out and this is where a lot of the focus has been. Um, so the way in which we did this is we brought forward pre-specified exploratory analyses from the data analysis plan into the main publication. And these were the EGFR slope analyses. We'd specified them to be done overall, but we decided we would explore the key subgroups, those three subgroups, by diabetes, EGFR and albinuria early. And the reason we're really interested in these is because there's been development of these into um, accepted surrogates for rare diseases and in certain circumstances, even common diseases are now being tested with these EGFR slope analyses, normally over about three years. And what's important to know about these EGFR slope analyses is that there is some terminology. There's total slope and chronic slope. Now, total slope is from, you know, obviously the first measurement at randomization all the way through the course of the trial. Um, but we emphasize chronic slope because uh, uh, with SGLT2 and it was actually there's quite an important acute EGFR dip in impa kidney. It was about a three mil acute dip, followed by uh, the effect on the kidney, which is the, the slowing of progression. Um, and then, actual fact, although we didn't measure this in large numbers in patients in impa kidney, uh, if you stop the SGLT2 inhibitors, we know from impa reg outcome that you get recovery of the EGFR from the acute dip. So it's some form of hemodynamic effect which is recoverable. So we think that the chronic slope is the, the more appropriate slope to emphasize um, with SGLT2 inhibitors. And in actual fact, the validation work done by the, um, uh, the CKD EPI and CKD prognosis consortium with the EMA and the FDA has identified this EGFR slope reduction, absolute reduction of about 0.5 to 1 mil per minute per unit body service area per year as being clinically meaningful and being highly predictive of about a 30% relative risk reduction on kidney disease progression. So if you get these types of effects, you actually might expect rather large effects on kidney disease progression if you were to follow people longer term. And so here are the MP kidney results. So this is the placebo arm, as you can see, uh, starting placebo uh, ha, 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 um, uh, had no acute effect, obviously, and the participants progressed on average by 2.75 mils per minute per year. And then this is the impact of flows in arm, the acute dip I described, followed by the slowing of progression. Um, so if you take the chronic slope, so that's from this point here onto the end, then the rate of decline in those allocated in impact of flows in was 1.37 mils per minute per year. And the difference between these two just happens to also be 1.37 mils per minute per year. So in actual fact, in relative terms, that's actually about a halving of the rate of progression. So our categorical outcome may well not have estimated the full effects of these treatments. So this is about a halving of the slope, the chronic slope. And then the question we really wanted to ask was how does this chronic slope uh, difference vary by level of um, albinuria? And so what we've done here is we've just done a simple forest plot. And this time, instead of this being relative risks, this is the absolute difference in EGFR. So that's that 1.37 mils per minute per year difference. You should recognize these numbers too. And what we can do now is plot on this figure um, the mean slope in those allocated to placebo. So those with A3 levels of albinuria, the highest levels were progressing relatively fast at four mils per minute per year. And obviously, uh, the lowest levels of albinuria, they were progressing rather more slowly. In actual fact, they were progressing just under one mil per minute per year. Um, some people call this aging of the kidney. I, I don't think we should call it aging of the kidney personally. This is um, this was um, uh, modifiable, as you'll see. Um, so I don't think aging is not modifiable. This was just a group of patients with uh, low levels of albinuria who are progressing much more slowly than the patients with albinuria. And you can see that it's modifiable because in magenta is the, the slopes for each of these subgroups. Um, and you can see that with those with the normal albinuria levels who only had um, uh, 84 primary outcomes, you can actually ma measure in much more sensitivity their annual rate of change. You can see we almost arrest their decline. It drops to 0.11 mils per minute per year. Um, uh, and the difference between 0.89 and 0.11 is 0.78. So that's the absolute difference. This isn't a relative risk, it's an absolute difference. So they're progressing at 0.78 mils per minute per year slower. So if your EGFR is 20 and you're progressing at one mils per minute per year, you might expect to be on dialysis in 10 years. Um, if your EGFR is 20 and you're on impagliflozin and you've got a UACL of less than 20, it could be substantially longer than that. That's obviously an extrapolation. 
but that's what these slope analyses are telling us. But what you can also see here, although I don't quote it, is there's obvious evidence of effect modification here. Um, they are as absolute risk is much higher and also uh, the relative effects may be different. Um, and so you can see that the absolute benefits in those that are progressing faster are actually uh, even larger still. So I look at these results and my assessment is that the subgroup analyses for the primary outcome by albuminuria are evidence of smaller effects in people with lower levels of albuminuria and it's not evidence of no effect. OK, so um, we obviously didn't just look at the kidney. We did pre-specify some um, non-kidney outcomes, and these were some key secondary outcomes which have attracted some attention. Um, so the hospitalisation for heart failure and cardiovascular death result, again, lower numbers than we're expecting, a non-significant result, a 16% relative risk reduction, um, if you were just to look at the point estimate. And similarly, deaths from any cause, um, a non-significant result. Um, but amazingly also, this 13% relative risk reduction is right on the, the line exactly where you see it um, when you meta-analyze all the trials together. So just not really enough um, power. All-cause hospitalization is important for payers and also I think for patients and also for us uh, as our as hospital services are burdened. Um, and we had over 3,500 hospitalizations through the trial. And if you look at at first and subsequent events, then you can see that the rate of hospitalization in those allocated impact of flows in was actually about 14% lower than those with placebo. And this was statistically significant. We had some uh, uh, some methods in which we control for multiplicity. So we can actually state this as being a, um, uh, as a hypothesis test, which is being confirmed. Um, and um, in actual fact, people have been investigating this because they've been particularly interested in it. It's not modified by level of albuminuria. Um, that wasn't a pre-specified analysis. People have been exploring it, um, but I think this is another important result. It doesn't just slow kidney disease progression in this population. It also prevented hospitalizations. And we looked at the different causes of hospitalizations, and there wasn't a particular um, uh, organ class uh, of um, uh, hospitalizations that it affected. It, it wasn't particularly vascular disease or, in, or um, uh, procedures or eye disease indeed. It, it was a, a pattern of about 14% across the board. But what about safety? So uh, I think the, um, uh, the, the data on low limb parameterization with Canvas um, it suggested there might be a small increased risk of a lower limb amputation. We saw 28 versus 19 events. It's not significant. Um, uh, two thirds of those were just um, toe amputations. Um, so uh, relatively small numbers of events. There may be an excess of nine events between the two arms. But there was clearly uh, an increased risk of ketoacidosis. We don't present hazard ratios because there's two numbers, too few events. The risk is so low, but there were six versus one. Um, and that included actually one patient without diabetes, but they um, uh, uh, had been starving for two weeks, had an MMI, had acute kidney injury. They had to really try hard to get ketoacidosis and the ketosis was, was mild and resolved incredibly quickly uh, with treatment. So if you haven't got diabetes, it's really particularly hard to get ketoacidosis on an SGLT2 inhibitor. We'll talk about AKI later. Um, hyperkalemia, no significant effect, um, uh, but we know from meta-analyses this is exactly the result you might expect, about a 17 to 20% relative risk reduction uh, in the risk of serious hyperkalemia you see across all of the trials, and then no effect on urinary tract infections, So, um, and overall no excess of serious adverse events. So I would consider these drugs particularly safe and particularly safe in people without diabetes. Okay, so um, that's a summary of Emperor Kidney. Um, it's 6,609 patients, a broad range of causes, large numbers with low levels of kidney function and albuminuria, but at risk of progression. And in this population, impagliflozin safely reduced the risk of the primary outcome by 28%. Um, and the relative risks were really consistent across patients with and without diabetes and across the full range of EGFRs down to, and I would argue below 20 mils per minute per year. And the slope analyses suggest that although they looked like there's effect modification by lower level of albuminuria, I would suggest there are kidney benefits which should be expected in all. Um, so the paper and all its details, including all those analyses in the appendix, is on the New England Journal website. But our website actually 
also www.mpkidney.org has the protocol, the data analysis plans, a whole lot of other uh, information. Um, I do encourage you to have a look at it. We'll keep all of our um, uh, uh, the website up to date with the latest information as the trial produces more analyses. Um, so, something. do you want to pause for any questions at this point? Um, I suspect there's another 15 oh, minutes there, I there can talk. Be, yeah, there seem to be some questions. So uh, there is Ayub. Uh, before you unmute yourself, Ayub, just one quick question from me is that, uh, you know, midway through Canvas, when they saw the amputation risk, they put in an amendment uh, saying, hey, if there is an open ulcer or, you know, something concerning, then you should hold the canaglyphosin. Did you have any such thing in the protocol for for kidney? No, we were streamlined. Um, uh, the Canvas result was a doubling of the risk of amputation, and I can see why they introduced it. But we, we had already saw in the trials that followed uh, and the previous trials, no excess risk. So we saw it as a hypothesis testing, sorry, hypothesis generating, and we tested it. Um, yeah, I mean, those results that you see in MP kidney, they could be chance. Uh, they're completely consistent with the overall results from the other trials. You'll, you'll see some analyses later. I'll, I'll, I'll put the results of Canvas in the context of all the trials um, uh, in, a, in one of the final slides in the matter analysis. Perfect. Um, so Ayub first and then Greg. Uh, thank you. Thank you for an excellent uh, uh, talk. Can you sh uh, show the slide again with the side effects? Um, you the SAE slide. Uh, yeah, the AKI. Yeah, here we are. Yes. So this is AKI is almost reaching statistical significance when we when you are showing the low protein urea, the protein urea uh, A1 and A2 did not show any significant difference with AMPA. A1, and A2. AKI is showing almost clinical uh, statistical significance. It's a 22% uh, increase in uh, uh, less AKI. Uh, so isn't it uh, really uh, telling us that there is decreased AKI in this population too? Um, I don't want to spoil the next slides, but yes, uh, there's a clear, uh, I think we should start thinking of acute kidney injury not as a safety outcome anymore. We should start thinking of it as an efficacy outcome. I mean, these are based on um, adverse event reports, so they're clinical outcomes in the main, um, but uh, uh, and they're not adjudicated except for an empty kidney. Uh, uh, and so, um, but I think we need to start, our mindset needs to, to change uh, I'm going to show you the results for the acute kidney injury um, in the next next bit of the talk. I just wanted to um, just to just to I think you said that the results were not significant for A1, A2 levels of albuminuria. I don't think that's the best way of looking at those subgroup analyses. I think the way to look at these analyses is to look at the overall result, which is what the trial is powered for, and then to look at, to see whether or not the result is different, statistically different, and and we see that it's statistically different. But you can't conclude that it works in one group and it doesn't work in another when you don't have power to look in individual subgroups. So what you have to do is, is start to assess, as we've done with the EGFR slope analyses, whether or not you think that the results are different and how different they are. And we wanted to assess this particular hypothesis, is there evidence of no effect versus evidence of a smaller effect? And I think the EGFR slope analyses are pretty convincing that it's evidence of a smaller effect on the kidneys rather than no effect. How that um, benefit is um, mediated, I think, is particularly interesting. It could well be that some of the benefits on the kidney are not being driven through uh, um, uh, reduced intracamerular hypertension, and they are actually mediated through reduced um, episodes of acute kidney injury, um, which I think is what you're probably alluding to. Um, so um, uh, I think it's I think it's incredibly interesting the mechanisms, but we we obviously have to delve more into it, and we can't answer it directly. I hope that answers. Yeah, let's take one question from Greg and then I'll let you go back to the meta-analysis. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Swapna. So uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you and your group for the trial. It's really nice to see, uh, you know, a very simple question with a very straightforward design, very elegant design, giving us so much data. And I really wish we had a lot more of these trials in nephrology because they're really fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, I apologize if you already presented this. I had to step out for a call, but 
there is some kind of diuretic and blood pressure lowering effect. And, and did you see any differences in blood pressure between the two groups? There were very, very small differences in blood pressure. Um, uh, almost nothing. Um, and I can't remember the numbers off my, off my head. I knew them when I was standing on the stage in Orlando. <laughs> but I think it's, a, but it's about two mils, per, two mils of mercury difference and about 0.5 mils of mercury difference of uh, systolic and diastolic respectively. M really small and nothing that could really explain the effects on kidney disease progression. I mean, the, the intensive versus standard blood pressure loan trials are pretty um, unconvincing that that sort of level of blood pressure difference has any effect on kidney disease progression. So I don't think that blood pressure or indeed glycemic control is the mechanism of these these drugs. Um, but they definitely don't raise your blood pressure. That's for sure. No, no. but and uh, was that a, was that part of the protocol in any way? So did the other group require other antihypertensives to do that? Um, so no, none of it was controlled. So it was a simple simple randomization. There was no protocolized different protocolized requirement to fix blood pressure. So it was left to the local investigator. Um, and there was about 20 sites in Canada, 500 patients in Canada. So um, yeah, whatever you do locally is what people were doing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Let's go ahead with the second part of the talk now. Thanks, Bill. Hey, something so yes, yeah, so um, look, we were, I was paranoid, I told you about the, the potential for the trial to not give a clear result in people without diabetes. So um, we wanted to make sure we could put the results of MP kidney in the context of all the evidence. So by the time Empikidney uh, uh, published, we obviously had an enormous amount of data available from the other trials, and we approached all the trialists um, uh, uh, with support of this collaboration called Smart C, um, and were able to collect data. Um, but we were actually able to do something actually quite nice and scientific at the same time. And one of the things you'll notice on this slide, these are the CKD population trials, is that not only have we got a nice range of EGFR studied from 56 to 37, and a nice range of albuminuria studied, but we actually all think differently and we all specified different primary outcomes based on slightly different sustained declines in EGFR. Um, and so what we actually aimed to do was a collaborative meta-analysis trying to get a common composite um, kidney disease progression outcome, uh, defining it in a unified way, but also because we were interested in acute kidney injury, we nephrologists collect all the acute kidney injury data together and then to meta-analyze it and compare the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors versus placebo in people with and without diabetes. So that's what we set out to do. And because we collect information on EGFR at a trial level and by primary kidney diagnosis for the CKD trials, we could explore it in quite a lot of detail, as well as put the benefits we were observing in the context of the harms. So I really enjoyed doing this meta-analysis because we had MP kidney we pre-specified this, we collected all the data, and then when the MP kidney results came out, we could straight away run this meta-analysis, which was published in parallel. And this is the outcome we selected for kidney disease progression. And we picked the middle middle ground. This is the, the DAPA CKD, 50% um, uh, EGFR decline from randomization. Uh, uh, so Credence was 57%, uh, MP kidney was 40%, 50% actually a pretty decent um, uh, uh, outcome to pick in terms of both its sensitivity and specificity. So we reanalyzed all the trials to this specific outcome. Um, and then we combined it with obviously the other components of kidney disease progression. And then AKI, we tried to get all of the data using the specific MEDRA preferred term where that was possible. And we managed it in nearly all of the trials. So we standardized outcomes as well as collecting um, the data from everyone. So um, these are the types of numbers of patients we have now in the trials. So in people without diabetes, we've got about 11,000 people in the five heart failure trials without, diabe without um, diabetes and about 5,000 in the chronic kidney disease trials to add to the humongous amount of data we already have in type 2 diabetes. And so we've got over 90,000 patients worth of information now from all of the trials. And this was the kidney disease progression result overall. If you're interested in the trial level results, they're all in the paper but this is just the overall result. So overall in all the trials, a remarkable 37% relative risk reduction on that 50% EGFR decline based outcome. And it was uh, evident in people with and without diabetes and with diabetes the same. So um, SGLT2 and it appear to work irrespective of diabetes status. Um, but as nephrologists, we want to see more detail than this. And so we pull out the results by the CKD trials only, um, and uh, we pulled out the results by diagnosis, so groupings of diagnoses that we had used in the trials. 
And so obviously diabetic kidney disease is one, and you can see the results of ember kidney and DAPA CKD align very nicely when you define it by the same, the same outcome. And actually, fact, although scored is quite short, um, it's actually got a result which is consistent and credence you already know. So in actual fact, you can also conclude from this slide, it doesn't really matter which SGLT2 inhibitor you're using, the effects are pretty much the same if you've got diabetic kidney disease. And it's true if you've got a high level of EGFR, which is what credence studied, and the lowest levels of EGFR, which is what EMPA kidney studied. So, um, uh, so whatever's available locally, I would use it. And then what about the other kidney diseases? Well, we haven't got large amounts of data, but if you just take the DAPA CKD and EMPA patients where we've got kidney disease diagnoses, then we can start to aggregate those in sort of a pooled analysis. You can see the numbers of events are relatively small, um, but if you test for heterogeneity across these and the results are generally similar, don't, don't do the mistake of looking at these results across in the lines and saying, oh, it doesn't, doesn't work. Um, it, the, the key thing to do is look at the general pattern across and you can see the general pattern across looks consistent and the general pattern is tested with this heterogeneity test. So our argument here with these data is that uh, across the ranges of kidney diseases, um, there is evidence of effect. Um, and if you want to go into more detail, we can pull out glomerular diseases, individual glomerular diseases, and the effects in people with IJ nephropathy are pretty remarkable. About a 50% relative risk reduction appear consistent with all the other glomerular diseases. We really don't have much data in FSGS, um, but for our commonest cause of glomerular disease, there's really good evidence that the, the treatment seems to, to work and, um, and is, the effects are at least as large as the overall result. Oh, I did actually pop that slide in, so I was describing it to you, but here it is the IJ nephropathy result. Uh, just over 100 outcomes, 1,000 patients with IJ nephropathy now studied. Um, less data in FSGS. So, Ayub's a point about acute kidney injury. Yes, we were fascinated by this. Overall, across the trials, a 23% relative risk reduction, completely consistent with the EMPA kidney result. And again, if you look at people with and without diabetes, and remember that the large amount of data in those people without diabetes is from the CKD trials and those with heart failure who are on RAS blockade and often a series of other uh, uh, agents which um, we think can cause acute kidney injury. And you can see that the there is a consistent effect between the two. So it reduces risk of acute kidney injury um, uh, by 23%. And we should stop thinking of this as a safety outcome and start thinking of it more as efficacy. Hospitalization for heart failure, again, 23% relative risk reduction overall, consistent results in people with and without diabetes. But this result here is driven almost entirely, the non-diabetic result, by the heart failure trials. There's, there's really very few deaths um, or hospitalization for heart failure in people without diabetes in either DAPA CKD or EMPA kidney. Um, but there are cardiovascular benefits, um, uh, particularly in people with heart failure. And then we know the risk of ketoacidosis. It's about a doubling. You can see with the 75,000 odd patients with type 2 diabetes that have been studied, you've got less than 200 events across the trials. So it's still very rare compared to kidney disease progression and cardiovascular complications, which we know these treatments prevent. Um, so ketoacidosis, an, an obvious side effect, and we need to recommend our patients don't start ketogenic diets. They do um, uh, have information about euglycemic ketoacidosis, and they do need to stop their SGLT2 inhibitors if they're fasting for any reason, surgery or being unwell. So what about this lower imp amputation? Um, okay, this has brought things into focus. Um, so uh, it really is very few outcomes in people without diabetes. I don't think this is a non-diabetic complication. This really is a complication of people with diabetes. And if you see here, if you aggregate all the results of the trials, including that doubling of risk from fat canvas, then you do get a 15% relative risk increase. Another way of looking at this is that canvas raised the hypothesis, the other trials test it. And if you do that, then the overall result you can see here, actually, when you look at the result excluding canvas, it's actually more modest. So I'm not quite sure exactly um, how these drugs are increasing the risk of lower limb amputation, or indeed if it's a true effect. But we assume that it is an effect in our analyses, which we go forward. And these are analyses here of predicted absolute benefits and risk. So um, let me try and orientate you to this. So it's CKD patients only. So these are the, the CKD trials. On the left is di people with diabetes, and on the right is people without diabetes. These levels of EGFR just happen to be the, the average levels of EGFR in people with diabetes and without diabetes across the trials. 
And then what we do is we took the, the averaged event rates across the trials and then applied the average relative risks to uh, those average event rates to estimate um, the numbers of events avoided and caused per 1,000 patients per year. Um, and so uh, if you look on the graph on the left, then you can see why I've been color coding all of our forest plots. This is kidney disease progression This uh, in, in, in navy blue, acute kidney injury in red, cardiovascular death, hospitalization failure in green, ketoacidosis in turquoisey blue and purple is the amputations. So the amputation risk you can see here in terms of absolute terms, the ketoacidosis risk in terms of absolute terms is small much smaller than the benefits that we're seeing on kidney and cardiovascular outcomes in people with CKD and with diabetes. And of course, because those risks of ketoacidosis and lean amputation almost are non-existent to people without diabetes, then all we need to do is count up the benefits and they are really rather substantial. Um, and the reason these plots have got enormous long axes, is, although I don't show it to you here, is that we also did this analysis for people with heart failure. And if you've got heart failure, then the bars go all the way down to the bottom. Um, and obviously people with heart failure and CKD, particularly large benefits in terms of reducing risk of hospitalization for heart failure. So pretty overwhelming evidence here that there are benefits in terms of absolute, term, absolute um, rates at which far exceed the potential risks, at least in the studied populations. So that was the end of the meta-analysis. Um, so we, we think in the studied populations, these SGLT2 inhibitors safely reduce the risk of both kidney disease progression and acute kidney injury. And it's irrespective of diabetes status. And it doesn't appear to be modified by primary kidney diagnosis. And we've already shown you an empty kidney. And I didn't show you the analysis from this meta-analysis, but it doesn't appear to be modified by EGFR. So it's relatively easy for us to decide uh, whether or not to use an SGLT2 inhibitor or not nowadays. Um, as long as you can get it reimbursed, um, really there's very few patients I think we shouldn't be treating, um, aside from people with type 1 diabetes, um, where we don't really have the data and the concerns about ketoacidosis are higher. So I thought I'd slip in another slide just to tell you what's next, because there was an editorial out in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday um, assessing some of these data, um, calling for longer follow-up and more data on mechanisms and in addition to supporting all the regulatory submissions to try and ensure that the impact of is available to patients with CKD, and um, we're also doing post-trial follow-up. So patients have been followed for two more years for uh, the primary outcome. So we'll get to assess in two more years the effects of two years of, of impact of versus placebo on four years of outcomes. And I hope that will give us more information in those that are progressing more slowly and particularly count um, kidney failure and dialysis is prevented assess the full effect of those two years and be useful health economic analyses. We've been doing MRI substudies in 180 patients. We've been looking at their kidneys and their hearts. We've got 660 patients with bioimpedance measurements serially, and we've got some uh, interesting biomarkers already being analysed, markers of acute kidney injury, but we're also thinking about much more extensive biomarker development in the stored blood. And our statisticians are at the moment uh, scratching their heads on how we can give you more um, EGFR sleep analyses to look at people with and without diabetes separately by different levels of albinuria, et cetera, because I think as nephrologists, we love to tease out different types of patients. And the only way we're going to do that is to look at EGFR sleep analyses, which are more sensitive. And I have to thank the 500 participants in Canada, the other just over 6,000 from elsewhere. Um, we've got support from UBC, uh, with Adira Levin and David Cherney in Toronto, as well as a collaboration, a great um, Canadian team who did brilliantly during all of the horrendous COVID-19 restrictions. And there's a collaboration of others elsewhere, um, which brought this all together for our community. And I can only echo Greg's comment about wanting to have more trials like this. I really hope this is the start of uh, even uh, uh, larger trials, which are sort of driven by academic questions as well as uh, questions that industry want answered so that we can have evidence um, on which to use medications. I think we've now got three pillars really of, of, of CKD treatments, ARAS inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors and finerenone. Um, and I think we really need to catch up with cardiologists and have at least four, hopefully uh, maybe five uh, in five to five years time. So I'll stop sharing and um, hand over to Swamp now for any interrogation.
Yeah, thanks for that fabulous overview of my kidney as well as the meta-analysis. Uh, I know there are questions. Uh, I'll, I'll start first and then I'll call upon others. Uh, so for the uh, side effects in the meta-analysis, you showed amputations and ketoacidosis. One of the things mm. we counsel about is the genital mycotic infections. Yes. Uh, which are probably driven by glycosuria. So uh, mm. have you done any analysis on uh, whether that differs by diabetes? Should we be counseling the non-diabetic patients about mycotic infections? Good question. We didn't do it by diabetes. Um, we did it overall. Um, so um, the very final web figure of the Lancet paper has got urinary tract infections, severe urinary tract infections and mycotic infections. Um, there is uh, uh, about you know tripling, quadrupling of risk of mycotic infections. They're really um, e normally very easy to treat. I mean, they're actually much more common. I think the patients don't tell us about them as much as they they they, sh they, sh they should. Um, but we managed to keep a lot of patients on treatment without having to hand out free cotrimoxazole, which I thought we might have to do when we were designing the trial. I thought we'd better send them impagliflozin and some free cotrimoxazole, but we never had to do that. There is a pound if they need it from the clinic. I think most people with diabetes are used to it. A few of the chaps obviously weren't used to balanitis. So I don't think it's a major um, a major issue. Uh, I think if patients are cancelled, um, I think I would cancel all patients, diabetic or non-diabetic, um, about getting a tube of trimoxazole just to keep them on the treatment. I don't want them coming to me to say, oh, I've stopped my treatment, I don't want to take it anymore, and not want to talk about why. Um, so I do counsel them about that. I do mention when I start a CLT tuners, if they get pain in the groin to stop treatment and get some attention. Um, and uh, I do obviously mention, I don't know if you can call them sick day rules, but not taking uh, their SGLT2 inhibitor if they're not eating for any reason. Uh, but I think they're really simple to implement. And in Pekidney, we I just wanted to say something I, I didn't say in the talk, which is our design was to have a follow-up appointment at two months. We didn't me re-measure EGFR after starting the SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, we didn't have any increased risk of acute kidney injury. We didn't have any short-term dropout. Um, I, I don't think you need to think of these drugs as being really complicated to start. They don't cause hyperkalemia. If anything, they very modestly reduce potassium. And so um, when you start the treatment, it doesn't need the same uh, potassium and creatinine check as when you start a RAS inhibitor. Sounds good. Uh, on sick day rules, I think, Peter, uh, maybe on that or something else, Peter has a question in the from the conference room. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Just to the extend the discussion about uh, effective albuminuria, did you look at that in your meta-analysis? Yes, we did. Uh, so um, we in the meta-analysis, we only have trial-level albuminuria. Uh, and tr and uh, so at a trial level, you can order the trials by level of albuminuria and then do a test across the trials. We did that for the, we ordered the trials by level of EGFR and we ordered it by level of albuminuria. We saw no effect modification, but that's really insensitive. Um, and so what we are actually doing at the moment is planning, you know, proper individual patient level analyses where we can do that more formally. Uh, the thing is, Empikidney is the only of the CKD charts that really recruited people with low levels of albuminuria. So we're not really going to be able to um, pull it out any further. I, I'm, I'm sort of holding out that the additional follow-up of two years in post-trial follow-up. I'm hoping a lot of the patients with low levels of albuminuria contribute to that study and we can measure a bit more of their progression because, of course, the trial does not uh, measure the, the, the effect of the drug after you've stopped it. So obviously a month after the end of the trial, all those that were on the SGLT2 inhibitors will have had a rebound improvement in their EGFR if they hadn't been started on another SGLT2 inhibitor and all those of placebo would have progressed a bit further. So long-term follow-up could be pretty informative um, for those that are lower risk of progression within the two-year follow-up period. Fantastic. And uh, Ayub has another question. Uh, you're muted, Ayub. Thank you uh, again. I noticed that it takes about a year to be on one of these medications to get a, a decrease in risk of uh, end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis. Is that correct? Um, uh, well, figures diverge of, after about a year. Oh, I see. You mean, well, yes. Well, yes, I guess you do. Well, we only saw them at six months and a year, so they weren't. They hadn't diverged at six months. But in actual fact, if you look at just the result at one year, that was significant even at just one year. 
And if you look at the result between one year and two years, that was also significant. And two years onwards was also significant. Right. So, yeah, obviously the 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 drug starts working straight away, in my opinion, on in terms of progression after the acute dip. Um, but obviously to progress 40 percent takes time. So it would depend on how fast you're progressing. If everyone was progressing really slowly, you wouldn't see the benefit until later. If everyone was progressing faster, you would see it earlier. So where you know where those EGFR slopes cross is really just an artifact of how fast you're progressing. Um, the, the, the reason I asked this question is we see in our multi care kidney clinic, we see quite a few patients referred late where they mm. start dialysis within six months to mm. nine months. And is it worth even initiating mm. this medication in this group yeah. of patients? Yeah, so really, it's a, that's a, there is at some point, obviously, you're not going to have enough time to modify risk. Um, I think they start working straight away. It's just the artifact of the graph that, you know, you see a statistical difference at one year. So um, if you've got some time before dialysis, I would start it. I personally would start it. The other thing to say is that some people are continuing these drugs once people are on dialysis. So peritoneal dialysis patients, you know, large amounts of glucose load um, and you can give them a, you can, whilst they've still got residual renal function, you could still do them some benefits. And I know that Hido Hirspinks is, you know, doing trials in people on hemodialysis um, uh, as well, just in case the benefits on cardiovascular disease persist. Um, so um, obviously there's a chance that you might get someone with an EGFR of 11 who you put on an SGLT2 inhibitor and they get acute drop to seven and start feeling awful. Um, but, um, but um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I've got plenty of patients with EGFRs less than 20 wanting to be on this including particularly informed ones. Thank you. Um, yeah, there are a couple of other hands. Uh, Dr. Noll. Thanks. Just a quick question. I just wanted to press you a little bit again on who you wouldn't prescribe these in. So you mentioned type 1 diabetics. So anyone with mm. this, so of our patients with established chronic kidney disease, other than the type 1 diabetics, is there yeah. who would not <laughs> prescribe these drugs to? It might be an easier way to think of this. I, I do prescribe it. To, I have um, in our trial recruited people with type 1 diabetes. Okay. One of the patients with type 1 diabetes out of 68 did get diabetic ketoacidosis, but I only recruited those with impressive control. I mean, that I could really trust. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very nervous about treating, you know, people who are non, non adherent. Um, and so um, if I had a very um, compliant type 1 who had prog is progressing rapidly, I would consider it. Um, I'm very nervous about people who have got recurrent urinary tract infections, particularly if they've got stents. If I'm honest, um, I, we didn't study them in a subgroup, so I don't know, and I really don't want to give them a stent infection. So I don't treat them, particularly if they've got an ileal conduit and other things. Um, so I don't treat them. Uh, polycystics, I don't treat either. Um, although I wish we'd included them in the trial. I, I'm waiting to see if other trials are done. Um, and then kidney transplant patients, I do tend to treat them um, in selected selected cases. Um, I might do it if they've got, you know, post-transplant diabetes and they could do with improving. I would consider if they start to develop proteinuric kidney disease, but I do it with incredibly careful counselling and I warn them about urinary tract infections. Um, so I am going well beyond the, the trial data in the patients who I think are at risk, just because we have such excellent safety data. And if you counsel them, um, uh, uh, then... Um, uh, then I think it it can be you can treat people safely. I'm trying to think of others I don't treat, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Um, Dr. Zimmerman. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, mine uh, building on uh, Dr. Noel's question about who you don't treat. You know, because we see um, so many elderly folks um, on multiple medications, and I think. Um, in the you know in the clinic when you've got 10 or 15 minutes to to talk about these things and think about these things i do actually wonder if if a calculator that would show us um you know given somebody's 90 years old and they have an egfr of you know 25 and they're not particularly proteinuric are you really going to impact their outcome and and i know that's the focus on renal and there's other stuff um, but I really struggle with our really um, elderly patient population and polypharmacy. So just 
you know, whether or not we we think about ways to make it easier to make these decisions in our older folks, because uh, inertia is a real thing. Mm. And I mean, yeah. Can I answer that one first? Because yeah, um, I suspect you've got a second question. Because, um, the, so the because um, um, I have the other viewpoint, which uh, there are obviously some people which are very frail who may not be eating properly, and you really don't want to, you know, cause glycosuria. You're a bit like a, a child who's growing and is not obese. You would probably wouldn't want to consider SGLT2 inhibitors in these people because of the, the simply the calorie loss. Um, but if you look at the trials, we've got some really sick frail people in the trials that have been studied to date and kidney including a large number of people who are, are elderly um, but also if you look at the heart failure trials they're a really sick group particularly the recent hospitalization for heart failure and there was dramatic effects and obviously the people who are elderly are the most at risk of hospitalization they're the most at risk of heart failure complications these drugs if they have got evidence of you know heart failure or you think they're at risk of these things are dramatically effective and in actual fact that i don't like the term numbers need to treat but just to you know, the absolute risk reductions could well be substantially higher in the group of patients you're worried about treating. Um, and there's obviously a threshold over which, OK, this patient's too frail, they're not going to survive long enough to get any benefit. Uh, um, but um, I would encourage people to think about polypharmacy, but also think about the absolute benefits and realise that sometimes people in randomised trials tell you these drugs are really effective. And the patients you're seeing in the hospital being hospitalised with, you know, what you think of as side effects of the drugs doesn't count all the patients that haven't come to hospital and you don't see because they are on these yeah. drugs. Yeah, and my second um, question was really whether or not, you know, you can speak to these, we'll call it sick day medications and potential side effects. And, you know, two years later, people have potentially forgotten um, the information that you provided to them. Mm -hmm. Do you have, have you created any sort of patient educational tools um, that you provide with them at the time that you give them the prescription? Um, yes. So, um, look, I'm a, I, I co-chair the UK Kidney Association SGLT2 inhibitor guidelines, being updated now with the results of the deliver and MP kidney. Um, but one of the things we did was we created a, well, a full lay summary of the entire guideline, but we also created a two-page patient information leaflet. I'm not particularly proud of it because it has a lot of information about side effects because people like to talk about them, but it has the sick day rules on it. So I, when I start SGLT2 inhibitors, I have a short paragraph of text I put in every clinic letter, which I send to the patient. I tell them about it and I give them one of these leaflets. Um, uh, it's all on the UK Kidney Association website. Uh, um, it's really there as a template for renal units to as a starting point. But that's what I do. I give to everyone. Um, and uh, we did recommend that, you know, at each appointment, we re we remind people about SGLT2 inhibitors and stopping them if you get unwell. Um, I don't actually have time to do that every time, but that's one of our recommendations to just to just to remind patients. In the trials, we obviously give them a, a participant card, but I can't do that in clinic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are over just over nine, a few minutes past. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Do you have time if if I can ask you those questions? But yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I'm more worried that you've got patients sitting in your clinics waiting to see you. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll let people leave if they want to, but I'll just go through a couple of uh, uh, questions. So Greg actually asked in the chat that in the post-trial follow-up period, um, will all patients, uh, will, will the placebo group be switched over to a uh, Flozen? No, so it's, it's purely observational. So, um, and it's very simple. We've tried all of our, our philosophy is just trying to keep the trial easy for investigators to do. Um, and so we are getting them to review notes every six months and enter their latest renal status, latest, you know, vital status, their latest um, creatinine, uh, ideally one away from admission to hospital, and their um, current medication use, but only if they're taking an MRA, an SGLT2 inhibitor or a, a RAS inhibitor. And so what we're expecting to see, as we often see it in all of our, our trials, is once a, a trial is reported, it's pretty remarkable. There's drop in over a few months uh, to a use of the agent, depending on how efficacious it is. But it's actually often the same in both arms. If it's not the same in both arms, we'll have to do some slight adjustments, but it's purely observational. So, um, um, but the thing is, um, if both arms have got equal levels of drop in, that's perfect. That's what we'd love because it means the analysis are incredibly simple. You really are just measuring the effect of two years of impactful versus placebo. 
Awesome. Yeah. And, and one last question, uh, David asked that, you know, after RAS inhibitors, we often check the creatinine uh, and potassium to see what is happening. Uh, in this case with Flozins, uh, should we even bother because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they in fact reduce AKI, there is no increase in AKI signal. So even yes. though there is a drop in GFR, should we not measure creatinine after starting an SGLT2 inhibitor? Uh, I, I, my answer is I do not routinely do it. Um, I don't have many patients in my clinic who don't come to me with some level of edema. Um, so I'm not worried. Um, if I've got a patient who I am slightly worried is someone who might be, you know, uh, uh, eubulimic or dry uh, or, or run the high potassium uh, or haven't been started on a RAS inhibitor or indeed have started a RAS inhibitor and had a had a creatinine increase, I would probably check it a week or two later. But they are really a, 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 the small minority of patients. I don't routinely do it, despite what NICE have told me I should do, because it's not evidence based. <laughs> Oh, so NICE is still saying we should be measuring? I believe so, yep. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, I think that's based on culture uh, rather than yeah. data. And the MP kidney results were not available when NICE um, did its guidance. And we clearly don't remeasure kidney function until two months later. And we didn't discover a hazard at all. Fantastic. Um, so thank you again. This was a, a great uh, presentation and a nice, really, really nice overview of the data. Thanks for making it uh, for us today. And for the audience, housekeeping is that uh, the recording will be available for everyone to view later. Uh, you will also get an email with the um, evaluation. So please fill out the evaluations, which we can send back. I'm sure it's going, going to be fantastic. Uh, okay. So thank you again and hope uh, hope we can entice you to come to Ottawa one day. Yeah, well, I hope we can entice you to, to contribute to the trials um, as well uh, at scale. What you love sites, you can dedicate and recruit large numbers. That's how we do it. And uh, well, that's how you do it. That's how, uh, how we bring this these data to the community. Yeah, yeah, count us in. Thank you. <laughs>